I recently posted on Twitter this observational study from New York that showed that people with MS who stop their medicine are nearly four times as likely to require a cane and nearly five times as likely to develop progressive MS. But how could this be when randomized controlled trials of disease-modifying therapies show a modest or moderate reduction in disability accumulation? I must admit that I posted this after reading only the abstract at home. I didn't have institutional access until I got to work and have since read the same article in full, which is so different from what I posted on Twitter that I actually emailed one of the authors and got a response. So is what they say really true? Is stopping medicine that deleterious? Stay tuned for an interesting lesson not just about MS, but also about statistics and interpretation of clinical research. So this is an observational study, not a randomized trial. And that's important because sometimes people make decisions for a reason. For instance, people may stop their medicine because they aren't doing well, and this can cause a bias in the results known as confounding by indication. They try to account for this by looking at differences in baseline characteristics and how they correlate with outcomes. But it's not a perfect study. A randomized trial, which is much more difficult to do, would be better. So just keep that in mind. The authors of this trial are extremely well known. These are established multiple sclerosis researchers. I've met Patricia Coyle and Robert Zavadnoff at professional conferences. Zavadnoff is the person who was involved in a lot of the research regarding CCSVI, for example. This is done in New York, and it's the New York State MS Consortium, and it looks at people since 1996. It's a fairly large study, 893 participants, and the baseline average age was 43.2 and the median initial EDSS which is expanded disability status scale a measure of disability in MS research was three which is fairly low disability so at the start of the study most of them had not accrued significant disability for the most part and the baseline disease duration median was 9.6 years so most of them had MS for some period of time and the average follow-up time in the study was 6.9 years, and the reason is people move, change insurance, so not all of them were followed through the entire duration of the study. The study uses the aforementioned EDSS, a scale of disability in MS, 0 to 10. 0 is no disability. 4 could be considered moderate disability. 6 means a cane is required to walk 100 meters. 6.5 means a walker is needed, and 7 means a wheelchair is required for all but short distances. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make informative videos about MS every Wednesday. The other thing you have to know about is censoring. The idea is, let's say you're looking at a particular outcome like requiring a cane. Not everyone actually reaches that outcome by the end of the study. Some may never require a cane and they may leave and not have follow-up. So for example, let's say Anthony needs a cane by this point prior to the end of the study. That is uncensored data. We know exactly what happened and when it happened. But if you look at Daniel and Edward, the study ended or they left or they moved before reaching the outcome we're looking for. That is known as right censoring. And when you look at the graphs I'm going to show, you're going to see a bunch of little lines that suggests a censored event. And it's totally normal. There are statistical techniques to account for it. But when you're looking at the graph, if you look to the right side of the graph, you'll see that the data are all over the place. And of course, they're less reliable because there are fewer people left in the study. So don't pay too close attention to the very right part of the data. I also think it's helpful to look at historical prognosis data so we know what we might expect in an untreated MS population. This is a database from Europe in the pre-disease modifying therapy era, and they found by age 44.3, 50% of people reached EDSS 4.0, or moderate disability. They might have some walking disability, but not require a cane. By age 54.7, half of people required a cane, in other words, reached EDSS 6. But if you look at modern studies, it's somewhat better. For instance, the MS EPIC study, which is at University of California, San Francisco, it's more modern. Most of these individuals were on disease-modifying therapy. Only 16% required a cane after 20 years years, and in this paper, the New York paper, it was only 20% after 17 years. 
going back to the European database by age 63.1, about half of people reached EDSS 7 requiring a wheelchair. Again, modern studies suggest an on average better prognosis. What about transition to secondary progressive MS? So many people with relapsing MS, as they get older, they have a lower risk of relapses and new MRI lesions, but they may have a gradual worsening of symptoms over years known as transition to SPMS. My personal opinion is this is not a good research marker because it's very subjective, often recognized retrospectively. And in fact, there's moderate evidence that even younger people with relapsing MS may have some subtle, even unrecognized progression. But anyway, according to a Canadian study, about 58.2% transitioned to SPMS after 19 years from symptom onset. By the way, secondary progressive MS and disability is more correlated with absolute age, time since birth, than duration of disease. According to a Swedish study, 50% develop SPMS after 15 years. And according to the aforementioned MS EPIC study, again, a more modern study where many people are on disease modifying therapies, only 24.2% who started with relapsing MS develop SPMS over 20 years. So MS seems to be getting milder on average over time. So who entered the study? What were their characteristics? Well, they divided people into four groups. People who are on disease modifying therapy the whole time, all the study visits, people who are on treatment but stopped, and that's the group we're really looking at, people who stop treatment. And so you can see 777 stayed on treatment, 196 stopped treatment, a pretty good sample size. There were people who weren't initially on medicine, but they started at some point during the study. And then there were 228 people who never took medicine at any point during the study. Maybe they did earlier in the disease, but not recently. Almost everyone in the study, over 90% was white. So unfortunately, we can't say much about other ethnic groups. It's just an unfortunate thing. Their age at baseline was around 42, 43, except for the group that never took medication. They were older, 49.5 on average. The median time or mean time of follow-up was a little longer in people who stopped medicine, 8.1 years versus 6.8 years in people who stayed on medicine. And it was shorter in people who did not take medication. Maybe they lost motivation to follow up if doctors weren't doing anything for them. In terms of disease duration at baseline, line, it was around 9 to 10 years, except for people who never took medicine. It was 13.3 years, so a little bit longer. If you look at the age of symptom onset, it was about the same in all groups. And if you look at the EDSS level of disability, it was the same in all groups, 3 to 3.2. And the time 25 foot walk, how far or how long it takes to walk 25 feet, it was about the same in all groups, around 6.5 to 7 seconds. And you can see right away, people who never took medication, despite being older and having MS for longer, even at the start of the study, they had about equal disability. So they kind of had milder multiple sclerosis, which may have been the reason they were less inclined to take medicine in the first place. But interestingly, people who never took medication were more likely to have progressive MS at baseline. You can see that 55.2% of people who never took medication in this study had relapsing MS compared to 849 percent who were on medication the whole time. And you can see, for example, 22.6 percent had progressive MS, secondary progressive MS, compared to 10.8 percent in people who were on medication the whole time. Now, this makes sense in a way because these medications, is particularly early in the study, really only had evidence in relapsing MS, so it would make sense you wouldn't take them if you had progressive MS. But how are these people doing so much better if they already had progressive MS? I don't have the answer. Now, towards the bottom is the results of the study. You can see the percentage of people who reached EDSS of 4, 6, or reached secondary progressive MS. For instance, 53 out of 196 who were on disease-modifying therapy but stopped at some point developed EDSS of 4. But Dr. Bieber, these data don't match your tweet at all, not even close. If you take these numbers, you can see that stopping DMT was linked to 59% greater risk of EDSS of 4, moderate disability, 54% greater risk of requiring a cane, EDSS 6, but you said it was almost four times more likely, not 54% more likely, and there was a non-statistically significant 8% greater risk of secondary progressive MS. You said there was a five times greater risk 
What is going on here? I'll explain in a moment. But first, let's look at the data in graphical form. This is a survival curve of people reaching EDSS6 requiring a cane. At the left side of the graph, no one needs a cane, but as time goes on, some people get worse and need a cane to walk. And again, we're looking at the four groups. And surprisingly, perhaps, people who never took any medicine did the best. They were least likely to require a cane. Of of course, this is not necessarily because medications are ineffective. As I showed before, people who are doing better already, who seem to have milder MS, were more likely to make this choice. So the blue line is people who were on medication the whole time. The green line is people who were on medication but stopped. That's the group we're interested in, and they did in fact do a little bit worse than people who stayed on medicine the whole time, but it's not overwhelming. It's not a fourfold difference. The purple line is people who weren't on medicine but started it later, and the red line is people who never took medication. Now, as mentioned previously, these slashes are censoring events, perhaps people who left the study and didn't have further follow-up. This is totally normal. You see a very high sample size, nice smooth lines at the beginning, and jagged data suggesting very low sample size at the end. But even if you look at the middle of the graph, you can see that it's separated into four clean groups. It's not so clear, perhaps, that people who never took medication were that much better, but certainly people who stopped medicine did a little bit worse. The survival curve for transition to secondary progressive MS is similar, so everyone starts off with relapsing MS. Over time, some people develop progressive MS, transition to SPMS. You can see the green line, people who stopped medicine did the worst, but only moderately worse than people who stayed on medicine the whole time, not a five-fold difference. And you can see people who never took medicine actually did the best. If you look at EDSS4, moderate disability, people who stayed on medicine did a little bit better than people who stopped medicine. So I was totally confused, and I actually emailed one of the authors of the study, and I actually got a response from a different author, I won't mention who it was, and they explained to me that the data is actually from tables three and four. And so what you're looking at are baseline predictors of EDSS6 requiring a cane. And it turns out if you're male, if you're older at baseline, you have a longer disease duration, you're more disabled at baseline, you're more likely to require a cane at some point. This has been reported previously. And they didn't compare people who stopped medicine to people who took medicine the whole time, which would have been intuitive to me. They compared people who stopped medicine to people who never took medicine. And they also did propensity matching. In other words, accounting for these confounders. And then all of a sudden, there was a huge difference where people who stopped medicine did much worse. And you can see this number 3.86. And the next graph is the same exact thing for secondary progressive MS. And they come up with this number 4.77. This is comparing people who stopped medicine to people who never took medicine and accounting for differences in baseline characteristics. But let's forget about their fancy statistics and just look at the raw numbers without accounting for confounders. So I'm comparing people who stop disease-modifying therapy to people who never took them, even though they're not the same people and obviously had reasons to make these decisions. And let's look at the odds ratios for reaching EDSS6 and secondary progressive MS. For requiring a cane, EDSS6, it was an odds ratio ratio of 2.02. .02. In other words, they were twice as likely to require a cane for progressive MS, 57% more likely. Obviously, these numbers are very different from 3.8-fold and 4.7-fold, so a lot of this is driven by the propensity matching. So I personally am skeptical. I don't believe these numbers. It's not to say the statistics are bad or the researchers are wrong. It's just that I think there's a third unseen confounder. My hypothesis is that these people who are older, who have had MS for longer, the algorithm, so to speak, is picking up the idea that they should be doing much, much worse, but it's just not recognizing that there's just a variation in how severe MS is 
and some people, if they're older, have had MS for longer and still have low disability, they just have a tendency towards milder disease, and the propensity matching isn't picking this up at all, so it's thinking these people who aren't taking medicine, they should be doing much, much worse, when in reality, they shouldn't be. It's just not a sophisticated enough model, and it's inflating the numbers enormously, creating these ridiculous values. It's just not plausible that these medicines are reducing your chance of getting progressive MS by 80%, 83%, if there's a five-fold difference. Anyway, I do think it is plausible that the study shows, compared to people who stay on medicine the whole time, people who stop medicine have around a 50% greater probability of needing a cane at one point, which is very significant. Not a full fourfold difference, but a clinically significant difference. And this has been seen in numerous other studies. For instance, this is another propensity matching study, in other words, adjusting for confounders from MS base, and they looked at stopping disease modifying therapy and the risk of any disability progression, not reaching specific milestones and they found that the time to disability progression was significantly shorter in people who stopped disease-modifying therapy versus people who continued them. This has also been looked at for specific medications. For instance, this is a study on people who stopped or continued Tysabri, an observational study with 242 people, average follow-up 6.5 years, and they looked at self-reported outcomes, bladder function, fatigue, and people who continued medication tended to report less severe symptoms. To go back to the New York study, I have a few unanswered questions. What DMTs were these people on? Was it mostly low efficacy treatments or also high efficacy treatments? And could you do a subgroup analysis and did that make a difference? Also, the issue of rebound activity. People who stop drugs that trap lymphocytes like Tysabri, Tyruco, Gelenia, Mazen, if they stop the medicine, they could have a rebound effect and get worse. Did that account for some of the difference in disability outcomes. So to summarize the results of the New York study, there are definitely some people with MS who are doing very well despite not taking medicine, and there seems to be a tendency for people who are doing well to be less likely to want medicine, sort of a reverse causation effect. Compared to people who continue on medicine persistently, those who stop medicine do a little bit worse on average. In this study, they were 54% more likely to need a cane, a big difference, but not an enormous difference, like a nearly fourfold difference. In terms of the comparison between people who stop medicine versus people who never took them, and then doing propensity matching to adjust the odds ratios and developing these enormous numbers, I personally just don't believe them. I think the more moderate effect of disease-modifying therapy is much more plausible, and that's been reported in many other studies. I didn't intend for this to be a hit piece. This is not a bad study. It's a good study. It's just that I would have preferred they focus on a different analysis, and I certainly learned something from the research and look for more to come. I'd be interested to know if you've taken disease-modifying therapy for MS. Have you continued on it? Have you stopped it? And how have you done clinically, and what would you like to see in the future in terms of other videos?